All right, guys. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to jump into the passage this morning. Title of the sermon today is One for All. We're going to be in John 11. But let me give you the big idea before we jump in and we pray and we go at it. Here's the big idea today. One person, one person messed it all up for you and me with their sin. But one person named Jesus has made a way to undo it all for you and me. And therefore, let's draw near to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, humbling ourselves once again, knowing that the only way that we can really hear from you, knowing that the only way that we can really enjoy the blessings that you want for us is first we must humble ourselves. And so, Lord, we come and joyfully submit ourselves, our ways of thinking, our ways of acting, we submit them to you. And specifically to you in your word in John 11 today. And we ask by the name of Jesus that you would speak to every one of us in this room. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And we all say this in the powerful name of Jesus together. Amen. 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 All right. Well, here's what's been happening in the gospel of John up to this point. Jesus just got done raising Lazarus from the dead who was there for four days in a tomb. And so now we're going to see in verse 45 on, we're going to see the responses of people around that witness that. So look at it with me. Look at verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, the resurrection of Lazarus, believed in him. They believed in Jesus. They saw the resurrection and they believed that Jesus was who he said he was. They gave him their life. See, many people, they think that uh, the truths of Christianity are built on absolute blind faith. You know, as if, as if we're going around as Christians saying, hey, there's a, there's a unicorn and Elvis is riding it and it's flying and orbiting earth and there's no evidence for it, but y'all need to believe it. You know, like some crazy wacko stuff with no, no evidence whatsoever, uh, you know, proving or even alluding to the, the statements that we're saying. Now, let me make this clear. First of all, that there's no way around it. Faith is required for us to be saved. Faith is crucial. It's necessary. Jesus said it all the time. We need to have faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't be saved without faith. But, but it's not like there's not any evidence to coincide with faith. Um, it's, um, in fact, I would say this is overwhelming evidence that Jesus is the God man who came to save us and that we should give him our lives. For instance, this crowd, they literally saw some pretty crazy evidence. They saw Jesus raise a man from the tomb who was dead for four days. I don't know about you, but raise your hand if you think if someone raised somebody from the dead, they might be worth listening to. I don't know about you, that's a pretty, I think I'm going to start perking up my ears and, and listening to what they're saying. That's pretty strong evidence that they might be, you know, worth listening to. Now, many people saw this evidence of a resurrected person and they, get this, logically and rationally believed then that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was God in the flesh, he was their savior, and that he is worthy for them to surrender their life to. They saw this evidence and they logically connected the dots and thought, I need to give my life to this guy. He's more than just a guy, he's God. Now we may not have been there that day to see it ourselves, wouldn't that be awesome if we were? But we have it recorded in a trustworthy history book and I think it's in our lap right now, called the what? The Bible. It's trustworthy. It's true. It's a history book, no matter what anybody tells you about it. And here we have the recording of this amazing evidence that Jesus is who he said he was. He raised someone from the dead. It's right there in our laps, loved ones. And so, may we choose Jesus because of the evidence. Choose him 
There's a lot of evidence to be seen. You know, I had a, I had a six to nine month season within the last few years. It's been a couple years now ago, at least two, three years ago. But I had a six to nine month season of deep-seated doubts about all the beliefs of the Bible and Christianity and even the existence of God, even as I was a pastor. And it was just, it was odd, I'll just say that. It was just odd because I, I was like a wave of the sea kind of being blown around. I had a lot of faith one day and then I like, like start questioning everything again the next day and then back and forth and back and forth and, and uh, this is kind of how doubt and faith work sometimes and I found myself questioning, again, almost everything, even to the very existence of God. And um, it wasn't complete, but it was just here and there and back, and I just couldn't get out of it. But you know what God brought, what he used to bring me out of it, and I'll say this, not just out of that season of wavering doubt and such, not just out of it, but to a more firm than ever, unshakable kind of place that I'm at right now with faith. You know what God used to get me out of that? A couple of main things. One, personal communion and conversations with him. And this is something, if you're not born again today, you're not gonna understand what I'm talking about right now. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit comes and he lives inside of you and now you are literally having this personal relationship with God, your creator. And uh, even as I would have doubts and sometimes even like, oh, I don't even know if he exists. And then he, you know, the Holy Spirit would basically be like, hello, I'm, I'm still here, dude. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, you know, and so and you just go back and forth and like, but that personal relationship held me down and grounded. But you know what else God used? Lots of evidence of his existence. And it really pulled me back. And like I said, to a place where I'm more convinced than ever, even now. And some of those evidence would be, for example, the Kalam cosmological argument of the fine tuning of the universe and how things cannot just be as they are by chance and whatever, that there must have been a creator, all the way down to the smallest little complexity of a cell. Guys, it is mind boggling. It is, I don't, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist when I look at that stuff. Also, for instance, evidence like in Saudi Arabia, it's documented. There's video, pictures, people have been there of some mountain that just happens to be burnt as if some fire came on the top of the mountain and burnt the rocks from the outside in. And it just so happens to have some altar down at the base of it that has Egyptian God inscriptions all over it, even though it's all the way over in Saudi Arabia. And it also happens to have quail running around by chance. And just so you know, this sounds a lot like Mount Sinai, and it literally exists today being hidden by the Muslim country of Saudi Arabia. Other evidence, for instance, and I could go for a while and tell you about specific people that I hear about or meet, people, some even that have everything that this world had to offer them, money, fame, everything, and they come into a personal relationship with Jesus and they turn their back on it. That makes no sense other than changed lives, and that was evidence to me. And so God, as I'm sitting there doubting and all this stuff, and he's like, look, look all around you, up, down, small, big people's lives, all around, I'm real. Loved ones, I wanna tell you this today. If you are here and you are doubting, God is real. Amen. And uh, Jesus did amazing miracles to give us the evidence that he is not just a man, he was God in the flesh, and that we should surrender our life to him. I call on you, look at the evidence around and believe in Jesus. Now, for those of us that are believers, you know, God has called you and me in 1 Peter 3.15 to give evidence for the faith of Christianity to other people because evidence matters. Faith is important, it's crucial, it's necessary, but also evidence. And that's why we've begun the Harvest Apologetics Training Center. That's why we are offering these courses and these conferences. And so I just encourage you as my brothers and sisters in the Lord, take advantage of this, these opportunities that we're giving to train us better in how to give evidence to those who have doubts because you never know what evidence it might be that God takes it and it gives them that faith that they need, all right? Now, uh, let's look at verse 46 again. 
46, and I want you to see it for yourself there because tell me if it's the same thing in your Bible. Okay, here, let's read this. Uh, Verse 46 says that um, all the Jews believe Jesus as Messiah because of the evidence of him raising Lazarus from the dead. And it would be crazy to think anybody would not believe. Is that what your Bible says, verse 46? No, right? Throw Throw something at me. All right, so instead, what does verse 46 say? Look at it. It says, but... Now, now, usually in the Bible, a lot of times in the Bible, but's gonna be a good thing because it's like basically, here's really bad stuff, but God does something really cool, okay? This is not one of those situations. Sadly, this is a bad time that we hear the word but. He says, but some of them, these people who saw the resurrection, they went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now, I don't, I don't think we really got that hit in home just yet. Like, like I don't think we really grasp right now the Pharisees, right? The, the, the people that this crowd went to talk to. Okay, we're 21st century Americans. We're a little removed right now from the context, okay? Let me help us understand the, the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the Jewish religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees had so much power at their fingertips in the name of religion, they could end your life if they want to. They are very powerful. They are very influential. They are very uh, uh, needed to kind of have a response when we hear the Pharisees, okay? And uh, we're a participatory kind of church. I don't know if you know that. And so I want to help us to, you know, uh, enter into what's going on here a little bit. And so uh, we need to have an appropriate response when we hear the, the, the name of the Pharisees. Maybe something like, ooh, all right? So we got to practice before we read on in this. Are you guys with me? If you're not with me, this is going to be like epic failure. And I know you wouldn't do that to me, right? So here we go. All right, I'm just going to throw some, you know, when you hear that term, uh, we need some ooh and going on, okay? So there was this Jewish group of leaders called the Pharisees. Pharisees, ooh, oh, all right, now we're starting to get it, right? All right, here's another one, a little practice. Um, you know, this coming Halloween, a bunch of kids are gonna dress up as the Pharisees, ooh, all right, good. All right, here we go. Look at verse 46 now. Uh, but some of them went to the Pharisees, ooh, all right, good, 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 all right. Oh, no, all right. Yeah, that's right, I'm doing, I'm doing my best. And told them what Jesus had done. Now, let's stop there for just a bit. What's going on here exactly? When it says but, and that some of them went to tell the Pharisees. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> All right, we're gonna turn it off now. All right, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> but it's good, it's like, woo, the Pharisees. All right, get this. They did not believe in Jesus. That's what that means. That that even after they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, they didn't believe. How is that possible that someone could see that evidence and not believe? Let me ask you some other questions related to this. How, How can multiple people see evidence of God's existence and hear the same gospel message, for instance, and some believe and accept him And others do the opposite. You ever wonder this stuff? Here's another one. How can we have many people come into our church doors here? And they hear the passionate worship of Jesus. And they hear the unapologetic preaching of the word of God. And many people say, God is in this place. While others leave upset, never coming back because they didn't like the style of music or the pastor didn't wear a tie or whatever. Polar opposite responses to the same experiences. You ever wonder why that is? You see, the reason is because of sin and the work of God in someone's heart. See, sin causes you and me if it gets a hold of us, to call good evil and to call evil good. You see, these people, they rejected Jesus even as they see that resurrection, even as they see that evidence because they had hearts of stone, as the Bible says. They saw good and they called it evil and wrong. Now see, this is gonna happen to you and I as Jesus followers. That when we try to share Jesus with others, 
people are going to reject. People are going to not see the evidence as clear as it is. But I want to encourage us as brothers and sisters in the Lord. But see, when we reach out and still give Jesus, even when some will not receive, some will not believe. But we're sharing Jesus for those that God is working on their hearts. We're sharing Jesus with those that God is gonna open their eyes. We're sharing Jesus with those that he is going to replace their hearts of stone and give them the heart of flesh. And I'll just say this, I praise God. And we have every reason to be praising God because we're seeing that happen all the time in the life of our church. Now, I do wanna take another opportunity though. If you're here today, again, here's the thing. If you're here today and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, do not harden your heart. Do not see the same evidence and hear the same gospel messages that everybody else is hearing and seeing and reject it. Give your life to Jesus Christ. He's everything. All right, John 11, look at verse 47. Now we're gonna continue on. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, uh, what are we to do? Uh, For this man performs many signs. Uh, Signs in the Bible, a lot of times are miracles, okay? Uh, If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and they'll take away both our place and our nation. You see, sadly, we see again these people, they reject. Instead, they trust in their spiritual leaders, They trust in their spiritual leaders. They go to the Pharisees and they tattle on Jesus. But see, for us, we need to make sure that we choose Jesus even when religious leaders reject him. We gotta follow him even if there's religious leaders that reject him. And that's what this crowd did, sadly. They feared the religious leaders. They trusted the religious leaders. They took the side of the religious leaders versus Jesus. You see, it's possible that some who are hearing this message today, you are under the teaching and the direction of religious leaders whom you need to reject and instead choose Jesus. You see, some of you right now, even just like because I said that, you're like, I can't believe you just said that. How, how arrogant. How, I can't believe you're, you're, you're telling people to reject spiritual leaders. Like, you're telling people, I would never disagree with a man of the cloth. I, I would never disagree with a spiritual, I can't believe you're telling people to do that. They have degrees, you know, they, they're nice and, and, and they're out there to serve people and they have all this knowledge of the holy writings that they hold to and how dare you come out and say that people should reject their spiritual leaders. But you see, <laughs> that was good. You see, the Pharisees, get this, they were the spiritual leaders of the day. And they were clearly not on the right side of things. They had the degrees, they had the pedigrees, everybody trusted them, right? But see, here's the thing. Just because someone's a spiritual leader does not mean that they are of the right spirit. Right? The Bible teaches often of false spiritual leaders. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 tells us that we need to test the spirits to see which one is being brought forth in a certain teaching. You see, uh, the Bible says there's only one spirit that's right, the Holy Spirit. And that means all the other spirits are demonic forces, demonic spirits. And, and what they do is they get these pawns, a.k.a. spiritual leaders of their false teaching that they are promoting and they get these people to propagate and to advance the false teachings. And so right now, some of you are like, okay, I'm a little, a little concerned. You know, maybe you're visiting, maybe you're listening on the radio right now and you're like, okay, I, I don't know if I'm part of the right thing. Am I listening to the wrong spiritual leaders? And so let me help clarify. And uh, one thing that we're about here at Harvest is clarity, And you may not even necessarily agree or like with what we say, but you're not gonna walk out of here wondering what we said, okay? But this is love. Let me tell you this, you need to be a part of the real church of the real God-man, Jesus Christ. You gotta be a part of that church, that Christianity. 
and any other thing you need to reject those leaders. So let me in love call out false teachings of our day. Rastafarianism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, any, any Christianity tied with universalism within it, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism. And now if you want, have other specific questions, come ask me. You see, guys, again, this is love to call out these false religions and these false leaders that propagate them. In fact, listen to what God told us in John, 2 John chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. He says, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, there's a certain objective teaching that's true. It's not subjective. It's not, rel- it's not, it's not fluid and it just changes. There's a solid teaching of Christ that we should hold to. Uh, he says, if anybody goes ahead and doesn't abide in that, they don't have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and, and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house house or give him any greeting for whoever greets him takes part even in his wicked works. You get that? We're not even to like hang out with false teachers and have them in our home unless of course you're trying to witness to them. That'd be a different story. A lot of times we need instead to run from them and instead run to Jesus. Loved ones, if you or someone you know is listening to spiritual leaders that are part of any of this list or outside of the real God, man, Jesus, Christianity, run from them, help them to run from it and run instead to the real God, Jesus. And listen, there you will find what you're really looking for. It is in Jesus Christ. Now let's look, now, look again there, verse 48. Um, if we let him go on, this is the, this is the Pharisees in the council now. They're you know, religious leaders of the day. And now they're, they're saying, okay, what do we do? Jesus just rose someone from the dead. And here they're talking, verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What was going on in this day was the Romans were ruling Israel um, and, and, they, and yet at the same time, they kind of let the Jews pseudo rule themselves to a degree, specifically within the realms of Judaism. And so what, the, what the, the religious leaders of the Jews are saying here is that they loved their government. They loved their land. They loved those things more than the true kingdom of God that comes through Jesus Christ. They saw Jesus as a threat to their government instead of seeing Jesus as the ultimate king of all governments. Now see, I, I love America with every ounce of my being. You're not gonna find more of a patriotic guy than me. And, and you know, God says in the Bible, he's placed government in our lives, in this world, to protect us from evil and to punish those who do wrong. I mean, that's right there in the scriptures. So we have high respect for the government. We should, if we love Jesus, we will. But sometimes the government may contradict the ultimate king. Sometimes we as followers of Jesus may be forced to have to choose between the rulers of our land and the ruler of all. And at those moments, we must Choose Jesus, even when the government contradicts him. You see, right now, there's a, a lawsuit occurring in our state between a church and the state. The church is challenging the state's overreach uh, into the affairs of the church. Uh, the state's been communicating some things recently that are not just unbiblical, but, but the wording is where it, it may be forcing churches to disobey God. That's going on right now in our state. And loved ones, listen, at these rare but sadly growing occurrences, there must be no hesitation as to who we are going to choose to follow. Government or God? God. Vice regent king or the victorious king? Ruler of America or ruler of the universe? You see, the previous owners actually of this very building that we're in right now, they're, they're heroes of the faith. 
when they were at the crossroads of this kind of decision, they chose the right answer. And they chose the Lord and they've had to face persecution because of it. Listen, guys, let's not be like the Pharisees and let's not be like the, those other Jewish crowd that went to them who loved their government more than the Lord of all governments. And let's also do this. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray that our country as a whole would begin to actually care about our creator again. Let's pray that we would wanna honor our creator. Let's pray that there would be revival in our land and specifically too, let's pray that even if the government and the land in general just continues to thumb their nose at God, that at least religious liberties can remain. Let's pray for these things in our land. Because we don't wanna have to choose between one or the other, do we? And so that's one thing that we should pray for in this place. All right, well, let's read on the rest of the passage, verse 49 through 57. And uh, we're gonna get our last point out of this. Uh, verse 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, right now, let me just highlight, okay, who's this guy? What's Caiaphas and high priest? What does that look like? Okay, so the Romans in these days, they would assign the high priest of the Jewish uh, people, um, and they would assign these high priests whenever the Romans felt like they wanted to. The high priest would carry out the big worship activities in the temple, which, by the way, the temple was also built by the Romans, but also the high priest at times would prophesy. What does that mean? That means that, that God would speak through the high priest from the heavens and speak to the people of the land. And it says that in that year, what year is that? It's actually the year that Jesus died is what he's referring to. We find that Caiaphas was that guy. He's the guy in that office of high priest. And so we read on verse 49 that Caiaphas said to them, he's like, you, you know nothing at all. Like, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Now, does it sound like Caiaphas believes in Jesus and he's trying to support Jesus? No, not at all. In fact, he rejects Jesus and he'd rather Jesus die than to have his uh, comfortable Roman appointed seat of power be threatened. As so we read on in verse 51, he, he did not say this of his own accord, but but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. And so from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. And Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples, verse 55. Now the Passover, the Jews was at hand and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, like, what do you think? That he'll come to the feast at all? Verse 57. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees they had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he would let them know so that they might arrest him. Now, I want to go back to verse 51 and 52. Look at that again. Uh, Caiaphas did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, here's what's going on. Caiaphas, okay, clear, clear, let's clear this up. Caiaphas was not a man of God, okay? Let's make that clear. But his office of high priest was from God. Caiaphas did not believe in Jesus. But God chose, nevertheless, to speak through him to ironically prophesy and tell the people of Israel that yes, one man does need to die, but through his death, the whole nation and even world might be able to be saved because of the death of that one man. You see, Caiaphas meant it in an evil way that Jesus would die. But God ironically in beautiful ways that only he can do, he was saying it in a holy way. It reminds me of Genesis 50, verse 20, when it says that what man intended for evil, God intended it for good. That's our God. 
Even when people are out there hard bent against God and doing whatever and evil and that he can just, yep, I'll just use that to bring about my good and my purposes. I love that about our God. So what's, what's all this one man must die to save the nation and the scattered people of God? What does all this mean? You see, it starts all the way back, actually, to creation of our world that's recorded in Genesis, that God made the first man and woman. I can't remember their name. What was their name again? Okay, good. And uh, but by Genesis 3, we see them rebel against God, uh, and, and they bring sin into the world. And specifically, God held the spiritual leader responsible, Adam. And since that day, every one of us have inherited the sinful nature that separates us from God forever because of this one man who messed it up for all of us. And that's why we have sin. In fact, that, loved ones, explains why there's evil in the world. Is because there's a sin problem going on in the hearts of all of us. But it all came from one man. Let me, let me say it this way. One man ruined it for all. But one man can redeem it for all. And this is the gospel message. And it's written about... And, Throughout the New Testament, listen to it in Romans 5, verse 12, what God says. God says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, that's the result of sin, is that we have to die because of it. And so death spread to all men because all sin. So it spread, it's inherited. Every one of us, because we're human, we get, we get this, this sinful nature. The result of it is every one of us, we have hell and separation from God awaiting us. But look at verse 15. I love this, is a good but, but... The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God. And the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Or it's it's written elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, this way. One has died for all. Talking about Jesus. Therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Jesus is that one who died so that everybody who puts their faith in him can live. He has made it possible to under, undo what one man had done way back when. I love it. Caiaphas had no idea. He had no idea how spot on right he was <laughs> when he prophesied about that. Now, why? Why has Jesus died then again? And it's spelled out in verse 52. This is so good. Look at this. Jesus, the one man, he dies for all, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. What's this whole scattered idea? What's this gather thing going on? Well, let me try to illustrate it this way. You know, every Christmas, I ask my mom, hey, mom, what would you like for Christmas this year? And you know what she tells me every year? I know it's gonna happen. And I always have to like, okay, really? Okay, great, that'll happen. But what's the next thing? Here's what she always says. I just want all my kids home. You know, I, I'm not uh, a parent of kids outside the home. In fact, I've, war- I've, uh, I've um, warned my kids. Um, they'll be grounded if they get any bigger. <laughs> They're not allowed to get any bigger. They have, they, I, because I know what's coming in the future that eventually they're going to sprout their little wings and they're going to fly off out of the nest. And I, I don't want that selfishly because I love my kids. And, and, and when I think about my mom and my mom and some of you in this place, you, you're an empty nester now. You love your kids. And yet the way life goes, the way God designed it is your kids are now out of the home. Maybe some of you here like I'm trying to kick mine out of the home, but that's a different sermon. <laughs> But see, as parents, we love our kids and they go away and they scatter. But just love when we gather back up at times. You see, God is the perfect father who loves every one of us like his children. 
in in a similar and different ways, but God longs for you and me to be with us. And you and I, we are lost and we're scattered because we're sinners. But he longs to gather us back into his hands, to bring us into his arms where there is all love and comfort and security and truth and life and peace and gentleness and goodness. That's why Jesus died one for all. And because he has, let's draw near to our God. He's longing to gather us, but let's draw near. This is profound when you really dwell on this. We can draw near to our creator of the universe because of what Jesus, the one man, did for us. If you're here today and you have not drawn near to God ever, you know if you're honest, you are still scattered because of your sin. You are separated from your God. Jesus did the thing that you can never do on the cross and the resurrection. He is where you're gonna find real happiness and joy and meaning of your life. Draw near to him by giving your life to Jesus Christ. And for those of us that are believers, there's at times in our lives when we can feel distant from God, isn't there? Maybe it's self-inflicted because of some sin that we love, right? And we've distanced ourselves from God. Or, or maybe it's just that there's a season when we just don't feel God or whatever that is, right? Or you're hurting. This is such good news for you and me. He's our perfect father in heaven. And he's come so we can draw near to him. Let's stand and pray. Father God, Abba, Daddy, you are so good to us. We, we are so scattered and so far from you because of our sin when we're really honest with ourselves. But you have come to make a way through Jesus Christ for us to be gathered back in. And so, Lord, I pray that we would learn more and more what it means to draw near to you. That we could just commune with you in personal and deep ways we've never experienced before. You are worthy. You are holy. We choose you, Jesus Christ.